Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our last episode of Transforming Our World in a Investigation of Self-Care. In this series, we pair visual artists with three other panelists working in the field to honestly look at what care means in our current world. I want to thank everyone for tuning in today and especially to our panelists for being here today and sharing their knowledge. Um, with that, would everyone like to introduce yourself and let us know how you come to the work? Hi, I'm Esther Garcia. I, I work as a librarian, but I'm uh, from the borderlands. Uh, it's particularly of the U.S. Texas, uh, the U.S. Mexico, <laughs> Mexico uh, border, uh, and I come to care because as self care because uh, I really had to try to cultivate it as a child. I think often um, people kind of thought there was something a little bit wrong with me, but it's because I was extremely sensitive and uh, and uh, empathic which is such a gift, but also such a torture. And uh, I think, um, you know, uh, I've had to uh, do a lot of self-investigation and I've done that, you know, through literature. I know I studied that, uh, but I did it for myself. <laughs> and I did a study in library and information science, mostly because I just wanted to be near the sources that were gonna give me all the answers. They haven't, but some, somewhat, yes, <laughs> so I'm as a librarian now in North Texas. Um, I guess I'll go next. Um, my name is Marcina Gonzalez. Um, I am what I call a resin collage artist from here, from Bronzeville, Texas. Um, a little background on myself. I was born and raised here in Bronzeville. So um, the work that I do is heavily based on this place. If you have never been here, or if you're, you're new to here, it's um, a pretty unique and very isolated place. Um, there's a strange blend of, you know, American cultures and Mexican traditions all kind of blended in together to, to one. And, um, you know, that's due to its location. We're here on the border. And um, this idea is kind of what drives my work. Um, so I'm always emphasizing the presence of the valley here um, and in the narratives. And my work kind of reconstructs my own personal memories coming of age here in Brownsville and kind of looking at how I developed into a woman here in this environment. Um, when I was younger, um, I was kind of, I always felt very less than and kind of ashamed of being Hispanic or, you know, Latina. I was ashamed of my culture, of where I came from, of, you know, my circumstances, how I was raised. I was not the wealthiest kid growing up. So um, I grew up with a lot of feeling of shame and inadequacy and all of this is very present in my work, but um, you know, the work doesn't really focus on the negativity of these of emotions. It's, it's kind of about reconciling with that shame and coming to terms with it, accepting myself, understanding my value and kind of celebrating and appreciate the culture now. So, um, I have a very long history of kind of trying to come to terms with, um, you know, who I am, accepting myself, loving myself, and um, in all in an effort to try and work out my mental health. When I was growing up, uh, I developed very early on um, very debilitating depression, anxiety. So um, I spent a lot of time at doctors' offices, psychiatrists, psychologists, counseling, therapy, medication, you name it, you know all in an effort to try and uh, get my, my brain to be happy. So, you know, through all of this, I kind of uh, learned about art and um, kind of was introduced to it as something as a tool. So for me, art kind of became my own way of taking care of myself and kind of, um, I found that it held properties that kind of temporarily alleviated the way I felt, whether I was sad or anxious, you know, it became something that I was able to use to take care of myself. So I always introduce myself, I speak on my art. So, uh, you know, that's who I am. Happy to be here. I love that. Thank you, Esther and Marcelina. Um, hi, my name is Ima Lohi or I'm a Sully. Um, I am 22 years old. I am a Valley native, born and raised here. 
Um, and I am also a community organizer, a writer. Um, and I come into this work um, very much like intentionally, of course. Um, of course, I know my title, so I know what that comes with is a lot of building of community, building more self, and also destroying and dismantling the systems that don't work, trying to, you know, just kind of build bridges. Um, but at the same time, I think I come into this work as just like a lived experience. It's almost like just given the identities that I hold, um, there are, given the identities that I hold, it's like I, I was called to this work, but it's also like I need this work as well. Um, and the way I kind of see my community organizing coinciding with self care um, is actually something that I learned out of it, like because coming into this, I learned it very quickly that I needed to take care of myself if I was going to continue to battle these systems, these monsters, right. Um, but at the time of being like a young 17 year old, um, I'm just getting started. I didn't know that that's what I needed. So I guess I'll just like give like a quick little anecdote and I promise it all makes sense with um, what we're talking about. But um, I started organizing when um, my senior year of high school, I was 17 years old in 2016. Um, and it was a response to the police killings and murders of specifically Alton Sterling in New York and Philando Castile, both black men, both black fathers. Um, and just being that young, I was confused at the fact that, you know, I still had my rose colored lenses on and thought like, what? Like, how can things like this happen where um, black men are murdered um, for no reason by like people who are supposed to protect us and all these things. Um, so it just took me for a loop, but I knew I wanted to be spurred into action. So my brothers and I um, organized a RGV to um, BLM uh, march and demonstration. And it got a lot of traction due to the help of other like seasoned organizers here in the Valley. Um, it, was, it got a lot of reach um, and by the same token, it got a lot of opposition. So we had people online organizing and calling us all kinds of names. Um, the day of the actual protest, they came and were present and were yelling and motorcycles, just a lot of intimidation tactics and a lot of scary stuff, to be honest. But, you know, all in all, I would call the demonstration successful, just given the fact that no one was hurt. I feel like connections were formed and I think that we accomplished what we went there to do, which was to show that there's a presence that values Black life here in the Valley, even if the population of Black lives is very small, but still the solidarity was established. However, at that time of being like a young 17 year old who was just like kind of catapulted into this work, I didn't realize how violent what I had experienced was, which was to be intimidated and yelled at and spoken over. I, there was children at the protest crying. It was a lot, it was a heavy situation. Plus witnessing a lot of black death online where you just, you open Twitter, you open anything and you're seeing that. It was just a lot, a lot, a lot. Then on top of that, I was, you know, kind of established myself as like some kind of spokesperson for, um, black and racial issues um and i was getting contacted a lot to do a lot speak at a lot of events do all these things and and now i can do it obviously i'm here god bless but it's like as a 17 year old um i did i wasn't ready like i was it was a lot i wasn't ready um and i experienced what we call in the activist space burnout which is where you just feel depleted and drained and with that kind of touching on like what Marceline, Marcelina said, which is, I experienced a lot of shame and guilt from that burnout because I felt like I need to pull back from this work, but if I don't step up, who's gonna do it? I'm letting my community down. All the lies that your brain will run off with, but you believe them in the moment. Um, and again, that's just a lot to carry as like someone just brand new to this. So um, something that I, I, I've recovered since then, um, obviously, but something that 
a line that speaks to me, which was said by Alicia Garza. Um, she's the she coined the term Black Lives Matter, which is the work will always be there tomorrow. Which is like kind of bittersweet because it's like, damn, we're gonna keep working, but at the same time, it's it's reassuring to say that it doesn't always fall on my one shoulders. Um, and I have a community that will step up and stand in when I am not able. Um, so I experienced that right out the gate in terms of this work. Um, so I'm happy that I'm here and I can kind of speak to this self-care more because it's something that personally I have had to grapple and struggle with um, and I still do, um, but I'm grateful for spaces like this. So thank you, Gina and everyone else, all my fellow panelists and participants who are here. Um, I'm excited to get into it. Thank you. Thank you, Case. Yes, I believe that self-care is super important and if you're doing organizing work or any kind of work, just to remember that we come first and our families come first and our and the people who are showing up on motorcycles can wait. <laughs> and I agree. Um, I was just thinking about um, I don't really have too much to add about myself, but I was me and I was talking to a friend about if you don't include your title in your introduction, um, where do you, what do you say about yourself? And um, so I was thinking about that, and it's it's a really hard question for me, I guess, because I've been at SCC for about eleven years now, and um, it's become my work. Um, so I guess just first and foremost, I want to say I'm a Leo, and. <laughs> <laughs> and that I feel that I'm, um, myself as a person is a sum of all the experiences that I've had with my community and my friends and the people who have brought me up and built me up. And every day I just, um, my work comes from that experience, I guess. Okay, so, um, The second question is, um, it comes from, I attend a lot of events, um, doing event planning and exhibit type work. And um, I love mental health. And so I'm always attending these self-care workshops and, it, and you hear about these tricks and tips and the special bath bomb that's gonna cure your whole life. Um, but it doesn't really resonate too much with me. Um, and I don't believe you can purchase self-care. So I wanted to ask you all, um, what does self-care look like to you? Um, I kind of want to say something uh, a little vulgar. <laughs> I um, <laughs> kind of said this on election night because I was just so anxious. And I like copied and pasted it to a bunch of my friends who were all texting me memes. And I said, uh, sometimes self-care is uh, eating a microwaved hot pocket in your underwear on your couch. It's <laughs> doing what's right for you in that moment, right? Yeah. And it felt, uh, when I told my husband, he was like, you said that. And I was like, I am so wise. <laughs> I am the prophet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I know sometimes doing the minimal I can to just like get through the day is a gift for me and not finishing strong and not getting through my full to-do list and not making a homemade meal or even making, <laughs> getting a healthy meal or even getting a meal. Like it's, <laughs> it's uh, crusted over with ice and th th I'm going to survive. This is what's going to help me survive or, or turning off the news for a full entire day. That's a gift to me. Uh, just anything that'll center me. Obviously, on days that, and during during this quarantine, especially in the beginning where nobody could find toilet paper, apparently that's happening again. <laughs> we're, back, we're back to the future. And um, people were uh, <laughs> trading Tiger King memes and 
the only things that I could do were maybe download TikTok or, or actually, you know, get coaxed by a friend to do uh, the, the work day because our work actually has like a, a mindfulness yoga once a week. You have to like be thoughtful about scheduling your day, but she would coax me into it with her. And afterwards I felt like a whole person for maybe an hour. And then, you know, back to the news or back to like, uh oh, I guess we're using newspaper for the toilet paper this week. I mean, it's just, it was a scary time in the beginning um, where you couldn't reach out to anybody. You felt like community meant hurting somebody physically with your presence and vice versa. So uh, sure. yeah, just, you know, just doing the bare minimum. That's kind of what self-care means to me. I also was, I was part of this one panel where the person organizing it was like tips, tricks, and whatever. And I was like, how about we ask everybody to reinvent one part of their life? And she's like, no, that's not a tip or a trick. <laughs> People need to leave here feeling like they got it. <laughs> it, was, it was, I felt it felt like a transgressive towards me. I was on the panel and I, you know, I didn't toe the line exactly. I just, you know, try to be thoughtful, but it's, it felt, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> I don't think I quite answered, but I think that, uh, that self-care has meant different things at different times. And sometimes it's just being extremely, extremely present and just, uh, the work will be there. Right. The, the work will be there, as Ima said, which is tough. It's so tough to say, actually, it can be very painful to tell yourself that. But then to also accept the pain and just say, yeah, it is going to be painful and live with and I'm going to live with the consequences. And then when the consequences come, getting angry again, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Well, I think self-care is, um, like you were saying, what works for you is going to work for somebody else. It's like deeply personal and it looks um, different for everyone, you know? And so for me, self-care is, you know, something that I have to have an active role in, you know, um, as yet as finding a way to protect my own happiness and my own state of mind. And this, like looking inward and like asking myself that is what self-care is all about to me. It's that active role. And um, it's very difficult to kind of actively engage in that. And so I always think, you know, what are, are there certain strategies or tools that we can use? Because like you were saying, there's no, you know, one, two, three, five step easy guide, like you'll find in, you know, self magazine or whatever, you know, get your hair done, do a face mask. Um, you know, all of those, all of those things um, feel great outwardly, but, um, you know, they don't really address how you're feeling inside. So, um, like, it's not easy. It's not a simple thing. So for me, when I'm finding myself feeling overwhelmed or anxious or, you know, needing to take care of myself on a deeper level so that, you know, I stay healthy and um, feeling happy or just okay. Um, what I find that helps for me is kind of um, doing something really engaging and fulfilling and um, something that makes me feel good about what I'm doing that I'm working towards some kind of end result, And, you know, for me, this, this is art, like I was saying before, um, when I work, my brain is completely and totally engaged in what I'm doing. And um, it's almost like a, like a reward to be entirely occupied. You know, my, my brain doesn't go to those dark spaces because I'm kind of working on, you know, finishing whatever I'm working on for the day. And, um, so being in my studio um, is where, you know, self-care happens for me, but um, this global pandemic has ruined that <laughs> and it's totally changed um, uh, the, the relationship that I have with it. 
um, because like I had mentioned, my work is directly based on, you know, all of my memories growing up and that very much includes my family and our history. And I have like a very deep um, love and they're very important to me. They are, you know, what kind of drives me as a human to be okay because I know my family is there expecting that. So um, in working during this pandemic and thinking about them and these memories, you know, are they okay right now? Will they be okay in the future? It kind of led to a lot of distress within me. So um, that relationship that I had with art kind of being something that helped me right now, I feel like I'm kind of working through that and getting towards a place where I can be um, good again. So I'm kind of a work in progress right now. So I'm kind of getting my own self care uh, little by little, just getting back into the studio and trying to to um, get myself to a space where I'm healthy in my brain again. Um, I love that. Thank you both for sharing. Um, and both of those things definitely, uh, both of what you all have said speaks to my own understanding of self care, especially the fact that it's going to look so vastly different just depending on who you're talking to and what that person needs. Um, so self-care from it's it's become this thing that's become more so like fashionable and like mainstream um which i think has a positive effect because it means that it's reaching more people the kids on tiktok are probably hearing about it um grannies on facebook are probably hearing about it like it's like reaching different groups and that's a good thing like we should be learning how to take care of ourselves more the only thing about it becoming a fashionable thing or almost like a fad or a trend is that it's becoming almost something marketable and something to profit off of. So like Esther and Marcelino are saying, um, you know, you go buy the bubble bath or the tips and tricks and like these quick fix type things. And it that can look like care um, for the moment. The thing is that when we're talking about self-care rooted and stuff like that um it's like how how much money do i ha need to have to feel better it starts to kind of look like that how much can i spend or how much do i need to put towards myself in order to be okay or to take care um so i kind of want to like decolonize self-care i want to like bring it back to some of its origins um and in doing my own research, I've learned that self-care actually has radical roots. It was something that was um, popularized by the Black Panther Party way back when. Um, and I thought that was so cool. Like when I learned that it was popularized because they wanted specifically, you know, of course, people of color, any kind of marginalized group, but specifically Black folks to learn to take care of themselves and learn to look after their own health and look after, you know, holistically, mental, spiritual, medical, all of that. Because in a society where the government, especially at the time, was not providing the aid and resources needed for Black communities to survive and thrive. So the Black Panthers st uh, stepped up and were also encouraging folks to take that care into their own hands. Um, so with all that being said, I kind of have created my own definition of self-care. I'll read it now. Um, self-care for me is any act that mentally, spiritually, physically provides fulfillment, comfort, and primary purpose is to nurture one's well-being and or self-worth. Um, I'm taking that just modeled after what I've seen. I'm just only speaking from my own scope. So I'm coming from a place of community organizing and I'm seeing that self-care was popularized from this place of liberating each other um, through community aid um, and self-preservation. So of course that doesn't mean that self-care needs to be like, okay, you need to go out and go start a protest, no. But it's more so just like, it came from a place of ensuring one another's survival, your own survival and your neighbor's survival. 
And I think that that's important. Um, especially because um, 2020 has taken us places that we didn't even think we, we could go. Um, so um, I'm, ha I'm finding it so, so important to have to be so, so intentional with the way I want to care for myself and others. Um, and yeah, it's gonna look different depending on who you talk to, what you need. Um, so it doesn't always have to even cost anything. It can very much just look like, you know, having a supportive reciprocal relationship with somebody. It can look like self-reflection through journaling. It can look like shadow work and meditation. It can look like art. It can look like reading books. It can look like, um, you know, just venting, crying, whatever you need. Um, whatever allows you a way to reconnect with yourself. Um, and personally for me, what that's been looking like is learning to rest um, without reason or apology. Um, it's so odd that we've even taken rest and slowing down as like a weakness kind of thing or something to be earned. It doesn't need to be earned. Your body lets you know exactly. Our bodies are very good at regulation. Like they will let us know what we need. And I'm trying to like close my eyes and listen more and listen without judgment and listen without, well, I haven't accomplished this or I haven't done that. Like Esther was saying, like what I need is what I need. And I don't want to feel guilt for that. I don't want to feel shame for that. And it's much harder said than done, but um Yes, thank you, Esther. <laughs> it's much harder said than done, but um, yeah, it's just a part of the journey. I think the care never, it's not like a quick fix kind of, kind of thing. It's something that is sustainable, something that you are hoping to find longevity in. Um, so yeah, that's that's my point of view on it. And I'm so sorry, just to cap it off, I think that there's a really great Audre Lorde uh, quote, and I'm just going to stick it in the chat. Yes, it's so. Uh, let me pull it up. I'm, I'm pulling it up. I'm pulling yeah, it up. let me go. Yeah, it's it's caring for myself is not self indulgence. It's self preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Yes, <laughs> beautiful. That idea of listening to yourself as self care is um, very profound. I think um, that was, when I was, I get nervous when I talk about. Um, my pregnancy because people see it as um, I don't know that you're either something or something not if you have or have not had a child but I don't mean it like that I just mean uh, when I was pregnant I people kept telling me the way that I should have my pregnancy and what I should eat I can't eat soft cheese but I can eat all the Burger King I want and like I was like that doesn't make sense for me and I started to realize that I guess that we have all the answers within us and like in all of our cells and all of everything, we are part of this universe. And um, just to listen to yourself and you'll know exactly, like exactly what you said, Ima, that we'll know exactly what we need. Um, I, I wanted to share something quickly over the holiday break, Marcy, when you're talking about um, taking the time and space for yourself, um, like place is very important for me, like organized spaces and uh, where we live. And I spent 10 hours going through my kitchen and moving my refrigerator and going through all my plates and all this stuff. And um, I realized that, I guess I hadn't realized it before, but um, I used to have uh, when I was younger, I lived with roommates and they would get home and the whole house was rearranged and um, they'd be like, how did you move this three person couch and all these things? Um, where'd you get this superhuman strength from? And I think those like those tasks that are repetitive and um, making your space for yourself are very um they're good. That, that's what self-care looks like to me, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, that's like a Buddhist uh, practice is washing the dishes. Really? Yeah, but it's such a pain. You can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
got rid of all but like three dishes. Like I have, I kept three plates, three, <laughs> three forks. Um, because it gets overwhelming and you have to know your limits. <laughs> okay, so um, I guess one of the last questions is about community and um, we see self self care is portrayed to us as like a singular um, act for ourselves or marketed to us like that. Um, do you think um, community involvement or community healing plays any role in self care or in care? I I think that there's a lot to be said here, and I think that my co panelists will really fill out this answer. But before they do, I, I want to give a lot of uh, gratitude and open heart to South Texas College Library Art Gallery, because not only did they uh, make the transgressive or, uh, act of having this event about self-care and uh, taking the space for ourselves, uh, you guys also did a care package for those that signed up for it. And I enjoyed my popcorn and my agua fresca and my little mug treat. And uh, it felt like, and I feel ready to share that into the world. So this gathering to me uh, kind of shares some of the values. I know my co-panelists will say more about this, but I, <laughs> this is kind of my Bible right now. It's called The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker. She just had an amazing, anyway. So one of the things she says is that a gathering is not a purpose. And the example she gives, uh, she gives many, but one of them is uh, a back to school night. And she says, that's not a gathering, that's a purpose. So that's, uh, and so she says, well, what about to help parents and kids prepare for the year for instead of back to school night? And she's like, boring. <laughs> And then she's like, to help integrate new families into the school community. And she's like, not better. This is, this is a real purpose for that. To help connect parents to one another so as to make them a tribe. And so once you have that as a purpose, um, then you can have a gathering. And so today, this gathering has, has meant that for me. It's very specific and it is disputable what we're talking about and it just makes it really like connected I feel so connected right now and I yeah and I've got more to a little more to say but I just wanted to to lay that out Emma can I ask you you've done um specific research in this correct and I saw you with some um panels and Yes, I've done research um, on, it's not specifically, I mean, I guess it's tangibly related. Um, my research is primarily about um, intergenerational trauma, particularly within the African American community. Um, and it's it's been a lot to uncover and discover, but essentially um, what I really want to understand is the ways in which traumas and the harm that we experience just living in this world um, isn't just our sole, it, it's not our sole fault and it wasn't our sole responsibility. We didn't acquire these traumas by ourselves. Um, sometimes it can be passed down. A lot of times it's just inflicted um, upon us as we're just going through, going through life. Um, I think that it's it, it's been kind of wild to learn that well there's this thing called epigenetics which is the idea that your cells can literally transform um based off of stress and trauma that you may experience during your lifetime um and that misshaping or mutation of your cells can be uh inherited or passed down onto your offspring and so on and so forth um and the reason why I'm even connecting that to, you know, healing as a community or self-care as a community is because um, I saw this tweet one time and I wish I could remember who wrote it, but it's like, we didn't acquire the pain or the harm 
that we hold by ourselves. So why must we heal by ourselves? It kind of is like hurting one another, like it doesn't sound pretty, but the harm that we inflict on one another is as natural as just breathing. Where people will be, conflict will be. And that's natural, but it's how we choose to address the harm, address the trauma um, that I think makes all the difference. And so knowing that if, we're, if we come from a place of just knowing that, well, I didn't come into this by myself and this pain doesn't have to be mine by myself, like I, I can always reach out to somebody and maybe always try and form me and ask people to help me heal. And I think that sounds super uncomfortable for people. Even me saying it, I'm like, eek. I know we talked, we mentioned like uh, signs. I'm a cancer um, and that's very like mommy of the Zodiac and everyone knows like the classic mom thing of being like, I don't need help even though they clearly want help. So I understand like what that feels like to be like, I know I'm in pain or I know I'm hurting and it's just my pride and it's just my ego standing in the way of reaching out or standing in the way of asking for help. Um, I personally believe that community is extremely integral to, um, extremely integral to the way we're going to heal and care for one another. Um, and I know we talked about it in like our prior, um, in our prior meeting when we all met, um, and this really great Rumi quote, which is, um, reach out your hand if you want to be held. Um, and every time I say it, every time I say it, it kind of like gives me the same like cold water feeling down my back, but it's so needed. The simplicity of that quote kind of breaks down how simple it really is to just say, hey, I need you. Like, hey, can you help me? Um, and I don't think it's our fault that it's so difficult to say those words. We live in a society that's very individualistic. Um, and also trauma can make you very hyper, uh, I forgot what it's called, hyper like independent basically, um, where we feel like we need to tackle everything by ourselves. Um, and you don't, you really, 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 really don't. It's very, it requires a lot of humility and it's a very vulnerable act to ask for assistance. But I think, I think we, as a society, and I know me personally, I'm all the, I'm all the better for it when I do, so. Oh, what you said about healing by yourself, I'm going to have to look at myself deeper because um, that really resonates with me. Um, I'm somebody, I'm a Leo, so I'm somebody who will not ask for help and will suffer in silence until you know um i'm at the end but kind of um i wanted to share a story um during the middle of the pandemic i got covid and um it was a very difficult time for me um not only was i alone i was isolated all these you know old feelings of depression and sadness and you know being hard on myself comparing myself to others kind of came back, all these things that I had worked on were back and I really didn't know how to deal with them. So I was just there in my room alone, um, kind of just resonating in all this negativity. So um, kind of speaking on community, I got a text, like a simple text from um, an acquaintance. She wasn't a good friend or anything, she was just an acquaintance and she was just, hey, how are you? I was just thinking about you, are you okay? And something so simple, like that kind of um, like hit me at my core, like I'm not okay. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to text me, you know, these two words, but it kind of um, made me realize the importance of, um, you know, maintaining those connections. And it's something that's really hard, especially I mean, in a pandemic, you're told, you know, stay away, you're not supposed to go out and you kind of forget that you, you can take that time to connect to others, it just, it takes a little more effort now. So um, kind of um, taking that time 
and understanding the importance of maintaining those relationships and that sense of community. And um, it kind of helped me um, realize I'm not alone. I, I can't do this on my own and I, I need that help. So um, that kind of changed a lot of, a lot of things and, and helped me kind of um, get my, my act together and, you know, stop feeling sorry for myself. But uh, I, I need that. I need to be held. I, I need somebody else to help me heal. So that what you were saying, I know really, really resonates with me. Definitely. Marcy, can I ask you, um, you mentioned something earlier that uh, was really profound to me. Um, you talked about how I, um, I'm kind of an introvert. I'm kind of a, so I think I'm, um, maybe that's why it resonated so strongly, but you mentioned like how it's taken us. So like you spent 30 years or however much, however long building these skills to become the person that you are, this, you know, to be social, to be, um, functional in the society of extroverts. Right. <laughs> and, um, and then COVID hit us and I don't, um, you said that are we losing those skills or are we how are we gonna get back yeah it's like now we have to be like proactive and deliberate to kind of seek these connections because I mean pre-COVID and even before then I was somebody who was super um I had a lot of social anxiety like I'm very awkward and my voice shakes even when I'm not nervous you know it's just something that I cannot help so um I, it was something going out and maintaining relationships or even just having friends was something that I had to, to put a lot of effort in. But I know it, it was something that made me a better human to have other people besides, you know, just my partner, you know, my, my parents, like, you know. Um, so I had invested a lot of time and a lot of effort into these relationships. And I really forced myself to go out and, and nurture these relationships. So um, at the beginning of quarantine, all of this kind of felt like a relief to me, like, oh, I don't need a, to go out anymore. Like, this is awesome. I don't need to work on my problem anymore um, because, you know, I'm being told I can't. But, you know, that's not true. That was a lie that I told myself to kind of justify the fact that um, my social anxiety is still there. But um, it's um, something that I'm still working on, you know, so kind of getting back to that, that little story about the friend who texted me, um, I kind of um, found myself um, remembering the, the, all this effort that I made and um, I don't wanna lose it. It was something that I, um, I think is very important in my life to have. So um, I kind of started thinking like, how can I reach out to somebody like this person did to me? Like I wanna make, I want to make somebody feel good about knowing that they're being thought of. And um, I kind of thought to myself, well, you know, you're shy. I, I don't like sending texts or calling, you know, God forbid, call somebody. Um, so I like, let me do this through my art. You know, it's, it's what I can do. And so like, I want to share with you, with you all what I'm working on actually because of this text, something so simple, it really, really like moved me to, to get my act together and stop being a little baby. But also I'm not being too hard on myself because I know that I'm, I am working through it. But so I'm creating these, well, I'm in the middle of creating these two. They're very tiny and they're very like simple, but it's still my collage work. And um, it basically, you know, two figures reaching for each other, kind of saying, hey girl, I miss you. Um, so I'm kind of like sending on sending, I'm planning on sending this little, these little um, collages through the mail to, you know, those relationships that I kind of maintain and make me feel good. So uh, I want to send them to y'all too. So oh. I'm going to get your addresses <laughs> later. <laughs> those are beautiful. Thank you. So it's something small and it's not serious work like I've been doing, but mentally I'm not in the headspace to, to dive back in. So I I'm love not serious work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
I, I'm back in the studio, so that's good news for me that I'm not, you know, scared of this huge monster that I created that I can, I can kind of face all everything that I was dealing with when I was isolated and COVID and all that. Definitely, that that resonates with me. Whenever we were told we all have to stay home and never leave our houses again, I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then what are we <laughs> 10 months 11 months later I'm um, yeah starting to realize how much um, I need other people and yes. um, healthy <laughs> well and and like I'm a sad about how uh, we acquire pain together and we heal together when we heal together it looks you know like self-care like different it looks different for everybody and there's that story of the of the um, ant and the grasshopper, and the, yes. the ants like, I I I I gotta get to work, and the grasshopper's like, whatever, <laughs> you know. But they need each other. They need each other. Yes. And um, someone who's always, you know, concentrating on, you know, uh, you know, I I can do this on my own they don't always build the social structures like the person that texted or like uh, the care package I got from Gina or what I've gotten from y'all, you know, you don't always build that if you're like, I can do it on my own. And so if you do have, if you are able, like even like just my dog, you know, <laughs> if you have like uh, build those social, those social structures, uh, there's a little less on your shoulder. There's still a lot. But. I totally agree. Um, and I think just like in a biological sense, like we are like very mutualistic beings. Like we literally need each other to survive. Like you really can't do it all on your own. Um, and I, this is so random, but I was having a conversation with my girlfriend um, yesterday and she was talking like, just about how someone that she knows has hired like um, a cleaning coach, like someone to help them like teach them like how to organize and clean their life and stuff, which is totally fine. You know, whichever reasons that people have for doing stuff like that, you know, it's up to them. And I kind of thought about it. I was like, if it was me, I probably would just maybe text some friends and be like, can you help me fold my laundry? Like, just because, um, I mean, I'm also fortunate to have friendships like that and to have people who I know can, who I know I can call and depend on. Um, but it's also like, Esther, you're bringing up a really great point. Like when we confine ourselves to healing and doing everything by ourselves, we're also losing out on these social skills and like connections and like opportunities for growth, like growth between two people. Um, and I don't know, I've, I'm not necessarily an extrovert, but I know pre-pandemic, I was like literally begging for like time alone and like time in my house. And in a weird way, when the pandemic came, I was like, well, I guess now I have it. Like, okay, I'm gonna try and make the most of it. And then so many months in, I'm like banging my head against the wall and like just feeling like mad anxious, mad depressed. Um, and really realizing that I can really only be so alone. Like you can really only be so alone. Like we really need people. And that has been like a huge lesson for me um, this year. And I definitely think like inevitably we have lost out on some social skills. We spent majority of the year inside the house. So like whatever work that we were already doing to like learn how to be better to people, learn how to be better to ourselves learn how to communicate better have been lost or have like depleted in some sense. Like that's just natural. We kind of have to like, you know, make peace with that. Um, but it can also be looked as like a form of opportunity because maybe there are things that we were doing beforehand that we can put more intention behind. Kind of like how uh, Marcy was saying, or actually what we all have done, like the, <laughs> I got the, this postcard and popcorn and snacks and everything just to bring on this panel today. Like the connection is so real and it's so intentional and it's holding me so much closer because I know that there's 
a like a thought behind it like i'm thinking of you and i'm thinking of you in a way that you want to be thought of i'm thinking of you fondly and i i want to express that to you and that feels so that's the kind of stuff that gives me chills that's romance you know um so i love that like i wish i wanted to like keep pushing that out more and it's so weird because like we've regressed but it's like we're coming back like with even more love even more even more intentionality um and those things have really held me and healed me throughout all that this year has been so i thank y'all and i hope that moving forward we can like continue to integrate these skills with the way that we like communicate with one another I 100% agree. I feel like we've regressed in some ways, but we've also been given an opportunity to really look at how we want to move forward. And um, thank you for thinking I'm romantic. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, it, it's been such a pleasure to work with you all. And um, Esther, I'm going to, should I say your quote? Are you oh. saying? Yeah, so uh, I, I, uh, there's this Japanese concept, uh, usually said during like a tea time, I, I'm sure Patty Ballinger in the audience is familiar with it. It's uh, something like Ichigo Ichi E, which has been translated to for this time only once in a lifetime. And the term means uh, it just reminds people to cherish any gathering that they may take a part in citing the fact that any moment in life cannot be repeated. Even when the same group of people get together in the same place, a particular gathering won't be replicated. Uh, thus, each moment is always a once in a lifetime experience. And I know that after like in the next uh, five minutes, I'm gonna step out into the world and uh, be engulfed with uh, the magic that was here and it's gonna have changed me. So when y'all see me again, I am not gonna be the same Esther. I'm gonna be changed by our experiences today. Very beautiful. That's beautiful. Okay, well, I think we're gonna end here unless anybody else has anything to say. Thank you all so much for coming and sharing and thanks to our audience. We made it to the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank Bye, everyone. All. Thank Bye. you all so much. Bye. Such a pleasure. Bye. Love seeing you all. Likewise. Hope we can, like, honestly replicate and do this again. We'll be different, but <laughs> we definitely need it. <laughs> okay. I think we have to. I yep. think so. Bye.